We're here at the University of Limerick for this week's On the Shelf. Our author today first came here as a law student several years ago. He then went on to work for the National Employment Rights Authority. During that time, he wrote two novels, which were rejected reportedly 47 times, but he persevered, all for the better of Irish literature. He's been a star of the writing scene here for the past decade. He's twice been nominated for the Booker. He's been shortlisted for the Impact and he won the overall Book of the Year at the Irish Book Awards. He's now back at UL where he teaches creative writing. We're going to go and see what books he's picked for us to discuss. So here we are in Donald Ryan's office in UL. Uh, you've loads of books. Yeah. Do you read in here? I do actually, yeah. I try to read, you know, at least 40 pages of, of a book a day just to kind of keep the old um, reading ticking over. It can be so hard to find time to read, you know, it's kind of a luxury. Yeah. When, like, would you read, like, in, uh, <coughs> make it part of your working day uh, or would you read at night or what's your... No, I used to always read before, um, before I could sleep, but these days I just um, gone like that. Okay. Yeah. So in the afternoon, really, kind of it's siesta time, I have a little read. And are you writing? Maybe a nap. Are you writing in here? Yeah, no. actually, I wrote my last three books pretty much in their entirety here. Um, and my first two novels I wrote partly in the library here. I sneak in. I didn't even have a card, but I just sneak in. Um, All right. To write, to uh, use it, yeah. How, like, is that because you were past alumni or no? You could have been anyone you just walked in on. Yeah, well, I mean, I live up the road. And it's, you know, the UL library is a lovely place to write. You know, it's pretty much always, you know, people are quiet in there and yeah. they're surrounded by books and it's just a nice place to go. And do you think that it helps to write that you have this separate space away from home where you work? Or? I think so, yeah. I think I might have become almost too dependent on it now. You know, I, I can't imagine not having this space to write. Yeah. Okay. It's great though, yeah. Okay, well, we've got five books here. Uh, so the first thing when I looked at the list of books was um, there's a degree of misery throughout um, really? some of these. Well, well like yeah, two of them are kind of dystopian. Uh, then The Bell Jar, which isn't known for being a bar yeah, last, but it's very good. Yeah. And then Angela's Ashes. Mm. Um, but I guess I'd just start with The Stand, because that was, to me, the most surprising um, really? book, I guess. Uh, well, uh, yeah, I mean, I, I'm a Stephen King fan, but I wouldn't necessarily have thought you would be. Mm. Why did you pick The Stand? I think because it's one of the books that, um, you know, I really, that really made me a proper reader, you know, because I'd always kind of read as a child, um, but I remember borrowing that book from a friend of mine, Gary Savage. Um, and Gary, if you're watching this, I'm really sorry, man. I've bought seven of your books, um, <laughs> your Stephen King books, that I never give back, 30 years later. And thanks very much. Um, but I remember him saying, man, you have to read this book, The Stand, by Stephen King. It's Wh just when was amazing. This? How old oh, I'd you? say I was 14, 15, maybe. Right, okay, okay. And um, it just, you know, it just sucked me in so completely. Um, and it's, you know, I, I guess, I, I think now, actually, looking back, that Stephen King must have modelled um, the form of the book on... The Grapes of Wrath, because it's kind of punctuated by these little perfectly expository vignettes, you know, mm. where he just introduces a character for no real reason except to kind of illuminate the background of the story and describe the character and their situation meticulously, and then all of a sudden they're dead. Yeah. You know, and the story goes on about this, this, this battle between good and evil, because, you know, in the book, um, the world's population has been pretty much wiped out by um, this thing called Captain Trips, this, this mad influenza. Um, and there's two groups of people left and you know it's pretty much God versus the, de versus the devil and God is Mother Abigail and the devil is the walking dude you know and just it, it just moves towards this huge climax oh it's amazing I mean it's just a perfect novel but was this the kind of stuff you were reading as a teenager mm -hmm. or no no you see I was a real oh I was horrible I was a real snob you know I, I read like Yeats and Shakespeare and you know and Ibsen and all this stuff you know and because I, I went 14? To, oh yeah I mean you know okay. my parents said you know had, the house was full of my parents loved the um the mid-century Americans so I had all those as well you know and I just read all these kind of highbrow um, books okay. that were at home you know I mean my parents weren't snobby at all I mean my dad was a labourer and a salesman and my mum was uh, working at bookies but they used to buy job lots of really good books and so I sneered at genre fiction as a teenager, you know, right, and all yeah. of my friends reading these books. So yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm a real reader, I'm intellectual, you know. Um, and then I fell in love completely with Stephen King and read everything he wrote and still do. You know, and I, I absolutely love science fiction like Ian M. Banks and people like that and Ursula Le Guin. Um, I just love 
And so did that broaden your reading habits? Again? Oh, for sure. Are you less snobbish, as it were, Oh, completely. Now? Yeah. I mean, I, I left snobbishness behind at around 15 or 16. Okay. No, totally. Yeah. Um, have you read on writing the Stephen I have, King book? I have, yeah. And we talk about, about actually, it. here at Chibwell, we talk about that book to the MA students in creative writing all the time because it's just so good. You know, it's, it's, it's the most instructive book on writing, I think, that you can get because there's so much of Stephen King, but still so little ego there, you know. Because like, he talks about how easy it is, but still how hard it can be. Because he's given advice on writing, but is he also is he illustrating it with his own experiences? Absolutely. Stuff, okay, yeah. right, yeah, mm. yeah, stuff he's done. Um, the okay, there was uh, another one here that I yeah, it was uh, sort of dystopian. Yeah, the mm. Doris Lessing book, um, the memoirs of a survivor. So why have you picked that? I picked this because um, Doris Lessing's book, The Grass Is Singing, I think is. Mm. It's one of these almost perfect books, you know, yeah. in that there's a tone in the book that's oppressive and claustrophobic that just grinds you down, but still you cannot tear your eyes away from the page. Um, and it's perfect. And so when I read that book, I started to really like Doris Lessing's work. But this book really stayed in my mind because of the way it's constructed and how kind of muted it is. And again, it's dystopian. Um, the world is kind of falling apart. And you know, we were saying earlier how, like, if you ask me tomorrow about five books, it yeah, 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 five you books, pick a different you know? five, yeah. But this is here today because she describes the world falling apart and it seems that this is the way it would happen if there was to be a kind of um, a crumbling of, of society. That things would fall apart kind of gradually and completely like this. And you can see this, the beginnings of this at the moment, you know, with, yeah. with Trump and Johnson in power in the Western world. I mean, you know, that's, that's crazy. Whoever thought that would have happened? And it seems as though this, this is quite likely, but this is kind of a journey. Um, the main character has this journey. She's in an apartment watching the world outside falling apart. You know, the, the police are gone. Um, society is slowly starting to fall apart. You know, um, there are roving bands of almost cannibalistic humans, um, you know, outside her apartment. And all of a sudden, it kind of, it, 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 in a very subtle way, subtle but sudden way, it changes to this personal narrative, this introspection, where she starts to relive childhood trauma. Okay. And it, it turns out then that's what the book is about, about this formative trauma that the protagonist experienced but it's just done in the most beautiful kind of a nuanced subtle way she's an amazing writer were you like just I mean it, it, I, like you said on another day you might have picked another five mm. books but um, when you started writing were you tempted to emulate any of these people oh, or the books absolutely. that you yeah I mean I spent years trying to write you know tonally like Doris Lessing um, I started to write books. I mean, I started to write a book about a couple who were sequestered in this cabin in in an unnamed savanna. You know, I mean, it was pretty much the grass is singing. You know, and then I wrote short stories in the, in the vein of Stephen King over and over again because his short stories, some of them are so perfectly formed. Like there's one called um, Roadworks that I remember almost paragraph for paragraph. You know, about a guy who refuses to sell his house. Right. Um, and then there's a compulsory purchase order or the American equivalent imposed on him. And I guess I mean I stole that for parts of. The thing about December, yeah, you know, but I guess all these writers will, will filter in and, and remain there, and you'll start to. H how do you find your own voice? Like, how do you stop? Mimicking? That's the just to write. You know, I mean, Julian Goff said it takes ten years Did to write your heroes out. Yeah, to write them out. Yeah, okay. Um, okay. Uh, so I don't know which. Do you want to pick another one there? Can you tell me. Well, Irene. Yes. Okay. This one I hadn't heard of. Sweet Francaise. I, I presume it's Irene. Anyway. I just call her Irene Nemirovsky. I'm probably pronouncing it wrong. But I mean, remember about um, 2003 or so when this book was kind of rediscovered and published. Um, my sister was one of the first, it seems to me, in the world to know about it. To know about it. She always is. Uh, Ma Mary seems to have discovered Hans Valada as well, my sister. She's an amazing reader. But she said, there's this book called Sweet Francaise, but it's this, this Ukrainian writer who lived her life in France, who was murdered by the Nazis. And it was discovered in her, in her daughter's um, archive years okay. after it was written. She wrote this actually while fleeing the Nazis. You know, it was contemporaneous. So is, is it a true story? Yeah, it's, well, it's, you see, it's, it's based on her experience, okay. but it's a love story between, you know, partly, it's, it's in the polyphonic form actually, which again, I guess, influenced me when I wrote The Spinning Heart. Mm. Um, and it's at its core, a love story between a German officer and um, a French woman. It's just the most beautiful book. Um, I mean, one of the points of view is, is of a cat who's roaming around um, this beautiful, um, garden on a summer's evening just before a bomb hits a village you know and it's just a perfect example of the the tenet of, of show don't tell yeah in creative writing because you know you don't hear a description of the bomb and its devastation you just you just follow this cat around for the evening you yeah. know and then the bomb hits it's just so perfect um and I mean she wrote this like you know in, in a state of high stress obviously you know yeah, yeah, it was yeah. in Vichy France you know she'd been arrested for being a stateless Jew 
Um, she was on remand, I think, you know, and then she decided to flee and eventually they caught her and, and killed her. You you said your sister Mary gave mm. you the book and I think you've talked to her before, like as someone that did, re, is a big reader and has, yeah. has she read your read your books? or? Have oh yeah, I mean Mary, stuff? like she's probably my second reader, like my, my wife and Marie reads everything I write first, kind of that day, you know. Oh yeah, where I'm, where I'm, I can make her do it, you know, yeah. So <laughs> then, when she comes out, she And then that weekend they go home to like, Nina. Mm. So, yeah. and your sister, what, like, she's just a voracious reader, or? Yeah, I mean, she takes, she's, this, she's, she's a lovely reader in that she takes books really personally. She takes them to heart, you know, and she has a real, honest, visceral reaction to books. And, and, and she's really good critically as well. Like, she can analyse a book really well. Yeah. You know, sentence by sentence. It's fantastic. Um, and she just buys books all the time. Um, and we kind of have an unofficial book club, me and my mum and my sister, that, you know, now and again it convenes kind of um, spontaneously. And we talk about books, but she really just loves reading. So you were generally a family of readers. Then. Absolutely, yeah, yeah. Mm. So was it a particularly proud moment that you got to become a writer <laughs> yeah. for, for them as well? Oh, for sure, yeah. I mean, I remember I just this fantasy for years growing up that someday I'd ring home to Nina and say, to Mum and Dad, I'm after being longest for the Booker Prize. You know, it was a real fantasy. You know, I mean, I used to used to play it out in my head how yeah, how, yeah. how they'd react and what they'd say and everything. You know, and so. they've done it twice. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's great. It's great. Yeah, very surreal. But um, I guess so. I mean, the, the house was always. We lived in a small house when I grew up, um, in a small estate in a village called Newtown. And Dad used to bring home books from work in, in the back of his van. You know, that he'd get I don't know what jumble sales or house clear outs or whatever. Yeah. He brought home. Um, it must have been an early copy of The Catcher in the Rye. It was just a grey cover, with The Catcher in the Rye and J D Salinger on, on the front of it. And I became convinced that he was a friend of my dad's. And that he lived in a house somewhere past <laughs> Portro, the next village up, you know, in the mountains. I was thinking, probably a posh house, you know, one of those houses up in the up in the hill overlooking GD, the lake. Yeah, sounds <laughs> right. Okay, yeah, yeah. I just I, I didn't question it. I thought, oh yeah, Dad knows this guy. Something Dad said about it. Dad seemed to be so familiar with the book, you know, and he knew the book so well, and and he referred to him as JD, and and he and he was talked about how how he called the book to catch in the rye. And it was oh yeah, I love the scene where he talks about you know the dream where Holden catches the kids to fall into a field of rye. And so, uh, for me, there was no question that he was Dad's friend and that he wrote this book and I was one of the few people in the world to know about it, you know, and I was, I was an idiot as a kid. So I was 12 years old, just started secondary school, and my friend Michael Gray said, oh man, there's a book called To Catch in the Rye, you have to read it. And I went, oh, whoa, whoa, hold, hold on a second. <laughs> That's my book. How do you know about that book? <laughs> yeah, yeah. I had something similar, I read Animal Farm at 12. Really? And I really thought I was the first person to figure out that it was, uh, it was a metaphor, oh, right. you know? <laughs> I remember writing the book report thinking, I'm brilliant, I've got it, you know? And then, yeah, oh, brilliant, yeah. get older. Um, uh, Angela's Ashes, like, yeah. you're, okay, so this is a, even though it's not all actually set in, in Limerick, but uh, it's a quintessentially um, Limerick novel, you are not a Limerick writer though, you're a Tipperary writer, or are you? I'm from Tipperary, yeah, but I mean, I use a kind of demotic that's kind of um, a hybrid of yeah. Limerick City and West Limerick, where my wife's from, and, and the East Limerick, North Tip border, where, where I lived, you know, growing up. And I didn't read this book for years. My mum read it when it came out first, because she was reared on a farm in Bird Hill and she and her dad and her brothers would go in to a market to sell vegetables and mum said they were given a stick each to beat away urchins in the 50s from the car <laughs> basically and she said these kids now were almost naked and so when people started to say that Frank McCourt made all this up that none yeah. of this happened there was, there was no poverty of, of this nature in Limerick mum said oh no it was way worse you know there were there were kids in Limerick who had a far worse time that he actually you know that he, he, he underplayed it completely it was awful. I mean, the man got such flack. Remember that time in Late Late Show, this guy started to attack him. Yeah, so what? There was a thing that he... But was it more that he was being unpatriotic, almost? Or was it that people said he kind was Kind of, lying? yeah. Yeah, I yeah. There's this whole thing where, you know, you, you, you have to say that where you're from is absolutely perfect, yeah. you know? I mean, and, and, but the thing is, people didn't see it. A lot of people didn't, didn't see it. The book is so full of love for mm. his family and the people around him and for Limerick, you know? And it's so nuanced and it's so full of humour. I mean, and the film didn't catch it. Yeah. But we went to see the musical. I was just going to say, oh, and they've made a musical. Oh my God, I actually went reluctantly going, oh God, musical, okay, come on, let's go. So it's unbelievable. I mean, I enjoyed every single second of it, you know. And so you think it catches the spirit of that more than the film Absolutely, yeah, yeah okay. because I mean, there's a thing in the Limerick City Dramatic that is full of, of kind of um, obfuscation and slyness and, and absolute fun, you know. You can never take somebody from Limerick City seriously when they talk to you. And same with Limerick County, you know. It's, it's, it's kind of rural Ireland, really. It's kind of Ireland outside Dublin, really, you know. And whoever adapted the film, they did a nice job in the film. It's a lovely film, but they didn't get that. Yeah. They didn't get that, you know, half the time, Fred, of course, tongue was in his cheek when he wrote yeah, this yeah, book, yeah. you know. And it's full of love. It's full of 
of, of humour and joy, as well as the awful tragedies, you know, of, of children dying of tuberculosis and this terrible poverty that they suffered. But it's just, it's, I think it's the book that influenced me most as a writer. You know, I remember reading it saying, this is, this, it's got this beautiful, literally riverine flow, you know, for a book set in the banks of the Shannon. You know, it's just, it just flows so beautifully and so perfectly. The language just feels so unforced, you know, it just glistens. And I said to myself, if I ever write a book, you know, and at the time I'd started books and burnt them and written short stories and burnt them. I said, this is the way I want to write it. I want it to be this true. I want the, I want the, the, the dialogue and the way people speak to be exactly the way they speak. And I want the dialogue to be in the exposition. I want to run from, you know, from exposition to dialogue with no quotation marks. I want it just to flow perfectly and smoothly like that, yeah. you know. I wanted to feel that accomplished. I mean, to think that he was, you know, he wrote this so late in life. You know, when the Pulitzer became world famous, it just, it seems so right. And it, in a way, it seems really wrong as well that he wasn't a famous writer for his whole life. You well, know? yeah, I, I often think oh, that. God, he was I, fantastic. Is the, the way it was written in the vernacular of people from around where you were living, like, did that have an impact? Like, there, there probably weren't many books being written where people actually spoke. Like No, but I mean, it spawned a glut of memoirs, you know, lots of memoirs that were, you know, great for the person writing them, but... Make no further <laughs> that. Okay, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and I guess, yeah, I mean, there wasn't, I suppose, a huge scene in, in, in Limerick at the time. Um, you know, it was always people like Michael Curtin and Kate O'Brien. Um, but he just, he, he kind of, in a way, put Limerick on the literary map. And he seemed like such a beautiful person as well, mm. you know. When you were writing, or well, uh, getting published with Spinning Heart and thinking about December at the beginning, were you aware that you, uh, to some level, would be representing people in Limerick and that they might have a response to how you portray them? You see, I never considered these things while I wrote those, my first two books because I wrote those books, first of all, to impress Anne-Marie. Okay. This was my first ambition. Um, and my second ambition was just to be able to say to my kids, if I ever had kids, I, I actually, I'm not just a bullshitter, you know. I, I wanted to be a writer my whole life and I eventually wrote two books. So it didn't matter at the time if they ever got published or not. And I thought to myself, you know, if on the very off chance these books ever get published by anybody, I'll change all the stuff that people might take offence at, you know. <laughs> and then thought, ah, sure, look, I just let it off. Because you have to, I mean, I, I think if you, start to, if you start to make lists of things that you shouldn't write about or that you can't say, that list will end up going on forever. It'll suffocate you, it'll wind around you, it'll just strangle you, you know. Yeah, okay. Okay, we've one last book, uh, which is, oh yeah, um which was a favourite once upon a time of mine, uh, The Bell Jar, Sylvia Plath. So mm. when did you read that? Um, I'd say I was 21 or two when I read it first. Um, and then I read it again about two years ago because I talk about it a lot to the students here. Um, and I, I, I talk about it to the students actually um, because I often advise people to start writing in the first person. Okay. And to write about their own experience because that's the truest thing for you. That's your truth, you know, and that, that, that will actually allow you, I think, most easily to strike your note to find your voice, you know, but I, but you have to look outside that then, you know, you have to start, first of all, you start with what you know, as Colin McKenna says, and then always, always reach out towards what you don't know. Because that's, that's the point of art and fiction, I think. Um, and this book was a dangerous book for Sylvia Plath. It, it describes her own um, experience with depression and because attempted suicide. It's her, it's her own life. It's actually called a novel. It's classed as a novel, but it's so, it's it's so autobiographical. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, everything that happens happened in her real life. Yeah. I mean, her mum tried to stop the book from being published. Um, you know, and it's so visceral, I mean, and it's so tragic. And, and you can see how Sylvia Plath ended up taking her own life. Um, and I read this, I mean, long before suicide, you know, had a direct and devastating effect on my own family. And I kind of, and it made me think a lot about people in that situation, you know, who just want to be dead. I mean, look, look at who she was and what she was and how great she was and the things she could do and how talented she was and how beautiful she was, you know, mm. and still for her whole life, pretty much, wanted to be dead. It just it's 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 so terrible, and, and, it, and it was so successful. But I think like mm. it wasn't long after it came out in the UK that she did kill herself. Yeah, like a absolutely. Month, I mean, you know, it's it's the, the book is her suicide note, really. Yeah, you know, and it, but also and also it and um, amazingly, and almost you know in a grisly way, it's so funny. You know, there are parts of this book that are just hilarious. You know, when her boyfriend's coming to see her in the in the asylum, I mean, it's just it's, some parts of it are just hilarious. Yeah. You know, and again, written with such a beautiful flow. And with such humour and love for the people around her. You you have written like I across your books characters that are uh, maybe not suicidal, but maybe but are on the edge often. And mm. like how how difficult is that to do? Like to to try and get that right. See, I think 
I know I, you might agree now, but I think as writers, we're always alive to darkness, you know, and we, we always dwell kind of in the skirts of darkness. Um, and I know my books, a lot of people say, I don't see it myself, like a lot of the time as I write, but they are quite dark. Um, but that experience, you know, is something I think about a lot, you know, mm. how people must feel in that situation, you know, leading up to it, the act of it, you know, and, 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 and the whole idea of wanting not to be alive. Mm. You know, it's something that I explore in fiction. And I know people say, I can't read Donald Ryan because, Jesus, it's just too fucking depressing, you know. But, I mean, these are things that exist in life. Do people say life. that? Oh, yeah, all the right, time. Okay. Yeah, 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 yeah. I know I shouldn't read what people say, but I do. <laughs> but this is, for me, it's part of life. It's part of existence, you know. And we have a duty as artists, I think, you know, to, to cast around, to describe things that exist, you know. Because what is art except the act of trying to represent existence as it is? Yeah. And so this is that's where I that's that's my domain really as a writer. It's where I it's where I kind of you know locate my characters a lot of the time. They're always kind of in this precipitous place. It seems. Okay, thanks very much, Donald. And Pleasure. that's all for this episode. Tune in next time when we'll have another author uh, showing us the five books that mean something to them. <laughs>